Hello and welcome to the Applied Deep Learning course. My name is Alexander Pacher and I will be your instructor for this year's edition of this course. In this course, we're going to talk about deep learning and how we will apply it to solve some really cool stuff. Uh, today, I will just do a preliminary course with some basic information for you to know, which is very important to understand what to expect from this course and whether this is the right thing for you or not. So a few words about me. As I said, my name is Alexander Pacher. I am currently a software engineer at eNode in Germany, where we're trying to build intelligent sheet music. And last year I completed my PhD in optical music recognition, where I tried to teach the machines how to read music scores. So starting with an image of music scores, basically uh, up to something that the computer, for example, can play back to you. So you just take a photo and do this with your smartphone. This is what I'm working on and I've used deep learning quite extensively for this, which makes a lot of sense. And I thought that the knowledge that I gained through my work with this is helpful also to other students and that's why I created this course last year. This is already the second edition and this year many things will be a little bit different. First of all, I'm not at the university as you notice um, and you will also not have any courses in person, but we'll come to this in a second. Let's talk about deep learning. Well, you probably heard deep learning or you read it in the course description and thought, yay, I'm gonna solve all the problems and gonna become rich and famous. And that's why I want to take this course. And you're sort of right, I guess. <laughs> well, there have been many examples of successful stories where deep learning has been applied to solve some long-standing issues. And it has been to such an enormous extent that the Gartner hype cycle included deep learning in 2018 as one of the top th points where uh, of, of this curve of inflated expectations where deep learning was kind of at the top. So in 2018, Everyone was doing deep learning, everyone was doing deep neural networks. Uh, and yeah, this is where we are right now. So that's probably the reason why there is quite big uh, fuss because it works for many things. This year is no different. Again, Gartner Hype Cycle takes about six different uh, um, topics, if you would like to say so, that are somewhat related to deep learning and AI and machine learning into their Gartner hype cycle. So this year they're on, on the rise, some stuff like transfer learning or emotion AI, and of course, everything that is related to explainable AI, because if you just have a box and you don't know what's going on under the hood, well, it's not that good. So. Applied deep learning is, according to Gartner, at the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, so the idea would be in this course that you get some understanding of what you can do and what you can't do with it. Um, talking about inflated expectations, has any one of you heard of CRISPR? I'm sure you've heard it somehow in the news. It's the genetic DNA scissors where you can edit the DNA very precisely. And this also led to some inflated expectations and to some speculation of what you can do with it and what you can't do with it. And people that are not that well educated might try to ask for some really interesting stuff. Could CRISPR give us unicorns? So well, we're getting creative now. Um, so there are examples of uh, animals that have single horns in the middle. So like the rhinoceros has one at its nose, but there are other mm -hmm. ancient rhinoceros that have it in the middle of the head. So anyway, I think that you could uh, get a single horn on a horse uh, by looking at uh, horns in other species. Uh, so it's in the realm yeah. of possibility. Yes. Yeah, it's in the realm of possibilities, leading to the thing that well, many things are possible with deep learning, but we're exactly here to figure out what is possible because the reality, well, it turns out that sometimes people speculate a bit too much or they promise too much 
And then when you actually try to solve the thing or work on it, well, you're not that good. <laughs> or you can't solve basically every problem with deep learning. So one of the students asked me, well, can I create a deep neural network that will program for me to solve certain issues? So I just throw the problem at the thing and it will create and write the program. Well, I'm not sure if that is possible. So the goals of this course will be to learn what you can and what you cannot do with deep learning. And to get the best um, understanding of this, you will be doing a project and you will gain hands-on experience on how to pull off an actual deep learning project on your own. So, and last but not least, once you've done this, you will learn how to present your results in a proper way. Because it's good if you get good results, but it's sort of, hard to communicate if you can't show anyone what you actually did. About this lecture, it is called Applied Deep Learning. And there is a reason why it's called Applied Deep Learning, because you will de uh, do most of the work. I will give you some theory and as much assistance as I possibly can. But actually, the entire course is in and around a project that you will do. So let's talk about this project. The project should be one that involves deep learning to solve a problem that you will come up with. And it's split up into several parts. First of all, you will have three assignments that you will have to program where you have to deliver some piece of software that I will take a look at and create. At the end of the project, you will write a written report and do a presentation about your project. You will also get a lot of theory in the lectures from me. So these will be recordings that I, I upload on a weekly basis. So you can actually learn about the thing that you're working on and get some background theory on that. For the project, first of all, you pick the topic. It's not up to me to tell you what you should work on. You say what you want to work on and uh, project type, which I will come to in a second. And the most important thing is this project should be something that you really are interested in, that is challenging to you and that's useful to you. It should be something, you know, that drives you, where you really want to work and you want to solve this. You should be passionate about your project. This is the most important requirement. About the project types, types I broadly defined four categories within projects to give you somewhat a realistic thing of, of where you're heading. The first type of project that you can do or can you, you can choose from with your own topic will be bring your own data. How that works is that you take an existing approach, for example, image classification or I don't know, something in, in the domain where there are already quite a number of approaches available, but you collect data and then you train the existing approach on your new data set. And that can be very challenging because acquiring data is not as easy as just downloading a few images. You have to curate them, make sure they're properly annotated, especially if you do some manual annotations, this will consume a lot of time. And as part of every deep learning project, there will be a large portion of just how to get useful data. The second project type will be bring your own method. It's kind of the other side of that idea. So you take an existing data set. There are tons of different data sets for all sorts of tasks. It can be x-ray scans for medical, from the medical domain, music samples, images, texts, translations, you name it. And what you do is you bring your own method. You take something maybe that already exists, try, try to improve it and apply some of the knowledge that you've gained throughout this course to improve or at least play around with your own method. You don't have to be better than what's already out there, but at least it has to be your own thing where you applied some of the principles that you learned in this course. The third type of project will be beat the classics. This is an interesting one because there are many challenges where there are already quite good solutions without machine learning and without deep learning. 
So you'll have, for example, line detection, just detecting straight lines in an image. There are a lot of algorithms from computer vision that already do this quite well. But still, maybe you've come up with an idea or with a project where you can solve one of these challenges with deep learning and beat those existing baselines. That will be beat the classics and the fourth and last category, which will be the most challenging one is beat the stars. This is a project which is probably only for doctoral students, but you know, there are so many different topics that you can apply deep learning to. Maybe you can also achieve this, but the idea would be that you take a look at the state of the art for one particular problem. Again, it can be machine translation or image classification, whatever you say, and you try to come up with a solution that beats the current state of the art. And it can be quite challenging nowadays because publish, uh, papers are published so frequently that, you know, if you wait a month, there might be a different um, state of the art, but at least you should kind of try to be in those like top players where you can actually beat some papers that were published last year, for example, for this particular problem. That would be beat the stars. How does grading work? As I mentioned before, there are five different parts and each of these parts will have up to 10 points each. So for your assignments, you'll have 10 points each for the report and the presentation at the end. The criteria for this is maybe a little bit uncommon. That's why I want to tell you here. First of all, of course, the result. So if you achieve what you plan to do, that will be part of the grading. But I want to add the notice that you can also fail. So if you try something really new and you train and you do follow all the principles of proper scientific work, but you still fail on solving certain tasks and you can argue why this approach failed or why it didn't work out, then failure is acceptable as well. Um, creativity, of course, if you try to come up with something that surprises me and cheers me up. For example, a student tried to generate new Pokemons from existing images, which I think is a super creative idea. Um, that's definitely considerable um, to give you a lot of points. Of course, complexity, if you take a rather challenging task like explainability of deep neural networks, this is definitely more challenging and complex than just applying um, convolutional neural network to do image classification. And the two things that are not that common at, in university classes, but I really want to stress this, code quality. So whatever you code, I will have to read it. And that's why you will get panel, uh, like reduced points if you produce poor code. I really want you to make sure that you write proper software. We're here in the computer science department and you should learn how to properly write software. That means properly name your variables, your methods, your functions, write some sort of documentation, try to test your application, ideally automate all of these tests and really make sure that whoever is reading your code can actually understand what you're trying to do here. And you know, there is a nice saying that there are always two people reading so it's a piece of source code, it's you and you again in two weeks. So this is not only for me, for grading you, but also for yourself to learn how to properly write software code. And last but not least, presentation. So whatever you present to me, I will have a first look at it and see whether you paid attention to write it down in a nice way, or you just sent me a, an unformatted text file without any structure. That's also important, especially of course, in the end, when you do your final presentation, this will also be like the quality of your presentation will be a criteria. The grades are fairly standard, as you can see here, it's a standard scale. So you have to have at least 26 points to be positive and the rest is quite standard here. So for the exercises, for your assignments, um, 
Let's talk about them a little bit. The first assignment will be the initiate project. So you will come up with a topic, you will gather data, research existing approaches, and then plan your work. And this will already be quite soon that you will have to hand this in. So make sure that you really quickly try to gather some information on the project that you want to work on. So this will be kind of a short assignment, but nevertheless really important that you properly research what you want to do and how you want to do it. The second thing will be the hopefully most fun part where you try to hack the thing away <laughs> and implement your idea. So you take an existing neural network, you play around with it, you run some trainings on, on a GPU, on a cluster, whatever you try to do, and then you start to improve this. You will realize, oh wait, I can add some, I can tweak it a little bit here and there and optimize as much as you can within the given time frame to get some really good results. But this is not where the story ends, because who cares if you train a great neural network if no one knows about it and if you can't run it or deploy and let anyone else share this thing that, that you were, came up with. That's why the third assignment will actually be the deliver part, where you will build a small application to run your model. This can be a small web application, a console application, a Docker container which internally runs the thing, anything that makes it easy for a customer or a consumer to consume your model and actually play around with it, try it. So this is really something that I miss in many projects or in many parts that you also need to be able to present your stuff to people who don't know anything about neural networks and deep learning. But if you can show them, them an image or have a website where they can upload their own data and see whether it works or not, that's exactly where I want to bring you towards too. This is the broad schedule for this semester. So I'll try to cover lots of topics that are related to deep learning. Um, of course, some introduction to neural networks, how you will actually do this stuff. And then I will pick certain topics that are relevant for your projects. And I'll try to cover the most relevant things, including convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, um, and also some practical hints for you for that is relevant for your project. The subject, like this schedule is subject to change because I might take the liberty to rearrange certain courses depending on your projects. So I'll try to cover most of the theory that you need for your projects as soon as possible. But it might happen, for example, when you want to work with explainable AI, well, the lecture about that will come at the end. So you'll have to do a lot of work on your own before we actually cover that in the course here. You'll have three deadlines for your assignments. These will always be before a certain lecture and one lecture in January where we might have some buffer if you need some additional, um, if you have some more questions or some other stuff or if we didn't manage to cover all of the material. It might be that something new comes up in the next few months, then I'll try to include it here. Otherwise, this will be one day off. Then. The last two slots, I'm not sure how we'll exactly do it, but most likely we'll all um, have the videos uploaded that you will do for the final presentation. Uh, at the end of January and then we'll watch them. I'll create a playlist and then we'll try to use these two sessions here to discuss them and see if, if we have any feedback and questions because it might also be really interesting for you to watch what your colleagues did and then discuss directly with them in the classroom. So I'll try to keep these two slots there. Some words about logistics. The entire course is due to Corona online, which is unfortunate, but I cannot change it. So we will have to um, arrange with it and you will, I'll try to come up with weekly lectures on these topics that are useful for you online. So like this video, I'll record it and I'll try to make it available to you as soon as possible at latest at the date where we would have the lecture. Um, we will also have weekly Zoom calls. So I'll try to set up the meeting where you can actually 
interact with me one-on-one -on -one or in, as the entire classroom joins. So I'll try to be available at least one hour every week. Maybe it depends on, on your demand. So I'll try to be available then. So you can actually have um, put uh, ask me some questions about topics and other stuff. You know, the stuff that you would usually ask me at the end of the lecture before we leave. And the final presentation, I already mentioned briefly this year. Unfortunately, we can't do it in classroom. Uh, that's why you will be recording them the same way that I'm recording the lecture. And you will upload it and this will be shared with others. The project itself, you will be doing it on your own. But you're not doing it completely alone because I want you to discuss with your colleagues. But in my experience, if people do projects together, it turns out that maybe one person is doing much more than the other one. And I really want you, everyone, to have the same kind of learning experience and actually, you know, fail and then learn from that failure when you try something. It might not work at the first time, but this is the way how I think you learn most. If you pick something and then you actually do it. There will be a tool course for open questions. Um, so really, I, I encourage you to take this opportunity, discuss with your peers, um, get some information. I'll also try to share and, and help you as much as I can. And one more word about this course itself. So it's quite crowded. We have lots of registrations. So um, there is a maximum of 25 students that I'll allow into the course. And the reason for this is not, well, because the online course, I'm not restricted by the room in this semester, but I really want to give each of one, each one of you individual feedback. So each one of you will hand in some reports, assignments, I'll have to read through your code. And if um, there are more than 25 or 30 people, I cannot do this because I am full time employment here. So I'll try to, uh, I'll have to limit the number of students in this course. Meaning that not everyone of you will be able to join this course this year. Hopefully it will happen again next year. And most importantly, and this is an urgent call to all of you, please do only sign up for this course if you really have the resources and you're willing to work on the project. Last semester, a bunch of students started it and then they realized, oh, this is quite a lot of work. I have to code and then they quit which is really unfortunate. Ideally, we have 30 students who, and I mean, you still have the, the chance to unenroll and let someone else in. So really, really be careful whether you're willing to work on this. The number of ECTS is actually quite accurate and people spend up to 100 hours. So you will also record your own hours coarsely. Um, and then, you know, to get some, some feedback on how much time you spend on this and people spend quite a lot of time here because they're passionate about the project and this is like the ideal situation but it means you'll have to do quite a lot of work so only sign up for this course if you're willing to do this because you know it would be unfair to start the course and then a month into the course i say no i don't think i, I can handle it this semester and then someone else who also wanted to take the course was not allowed in so just be fair to your peers. One more word about logistics. I unfortunately do not have a server farm behind me, so you will need to bring your own computing resources. But the good news is there are many chances and many opportunities and possibilities how you can actually do train larger, uh, larger neural networks, even without spending a lot of money. So if you have um, modern computer with a graphics card that is CUDA enabled, you can probably train most networks on your own on your local machine. But there are also some other great opportunities like Google Callup, where you can run Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud and also uh, train neural networks on quite substantial GPUs. I'm not exactly what the current quota is, but I think you have really have a lot of memory and uh, quite strong GPUs and this is all for free, which I think is amazing. Um, there are also other vendors where you can run similar notebooks, some Jupyter notebooks or stuff. And most of them 
um, have a free option where you can start for free, but if you train too much, you might have to pay something. So make sure you kind of prepare everything you have on your own. I think that's all for the logistics for now. With all that started, let's dive right into it.